Can I, thank you for your patience with the technical problems, hopefully the last of them. Um, so I'm from Wolfram Research. What we do at Wolfram is we automate computation. So we do that uh, to make experts more productive, but also to allow people without expertise to actually be able to use uh, powerful computational tools. Um, so what I'm going to do in this talk is very much focus on that second end of things, that I'm going to treat you all like complete novices. And my claim is that in about uh, 30 minutes or so, I can show you enough that with the automation provided by the Wolfram language, you can actually be productive as an AI expert. That's my claim. And I'm going to throw in some live computation and a few random things that may or may not work al along the way. So let's start with uh, some conceptual um, background, first of all. You need the basic ideas before we try and actually do anything. Um, and I'm going to do the opposite of what my industry is supposed to do. I'm going to unhype machine learning, because all of this stuff that you hear about, deep learning, recurrent neural networks, convolutional neural networks, my claim is it's all just fitting. It's all just a fancier version of what you did in school um, when you were probably 15 or 16. So let's go right back to basics here and say, what do I mean by fitting then? So here's a, here's a kind of thing that you did in school. You had some data. Maybe this was how far somebody seemed to have traveled over time. And what you did was you had a model in your mind. You said, we're going to make this a straight line. That's our model. And so you come along, and you give it a model, and you uh, got your ruler on the paper, and you drew a line that you thought was a good fit. And the idea of that, the basic idea of the model, is that you can then start filling in the gaps. You can say, we know what would have happened here. If we'd measured a point here, it, uh, it would have been at this, uh, at this distance at this time. And to some extent, you can extrapolate as well. Although, of course, the um, it's a leap of faith to say that what will happen after the data was collected continues to behave in a similar way, but that is also the, a benefit of, of having a, a fitted model. So you've already, anyone who's done fitting on a computer, you've automatically done machine learning, because when you do this automatically, these two numbers that describe a straight line, they're learned from the data. But there's a couple of problems with this uh, kind of fitting that you learned in school. One is, I had to come in as a human at the beginning and say, that's a straight line. So that's, that's not completely artificial intelligence. I had to provide the insight, and the computer just automated um, the, the application of my model. Now, of course, we can, uh, we can change that and try and uh, adapt to different kinds of data. If this data wasn't straight, we could say, well, what if uh, our model was curved in some way and we can change it? But we're always having to intervene as a human. And then there's another problem, which is that if I intervene too much and have a really rich model, crazy stuff starts happening. And the reason is this is called overfitting, is that now I'm, I've given it too much freedom in the model. It's trying to, instead of get the essence of the thing that was going on, the car going on a journey, it's now trying to capture the noise, the randomness of the bad timings and, uh, and, uh, and bad record keeping. And so we end up with a model that doesn't help us in any prediction. Right, so this is where we come back up to, up to date and say, so what is, what is it that's exciting in the AI world, in this whole kind of automated machine learning that's different from that? Well, now we have a collection of tools for doing this fitting that are much more flexible. I don't have to in intervene so much. They're more robust against overfitting, so they capture the essence, the predictable essence of, uh, of what we're observing more than the, the noise. But the biggest thing is dimensionality. So in my how far have I traveled over time, I had two di one dimension in and one dimension out. Time in, how far I traveled out. So it's a, a, a totally sort of one-dimensional problem in both directions. And usually, what we want to do is solve interesting problems. And interesting problems are very high-dimensional input. We have lots of data, not just one number. Uh, and very often as well, we want to get high-dimensional output out, something that isn't just a number out. Um, and we've also got the complexity that it's not always numbers. So if we actually look at what these kind of good models can do that aren't restricted to low-dimensional, um, pre-decided models uh, in, in too rigid a way, then it takes a bit of a leap of imagination to think, what does it mean to fill in that gap in the data that I had in my original plot? Well, here's, uh, let's have a look at a few uh, real models that uh, are doing things from trained from real data. So, uh, so this is taking very high-dimensional input in, it's seeing a person, so it's getting maybe 10,000 data points in for the image, and the idea is I can hold up uh, objects and it can figure out what they are, bottled water and uh, goblet, that'll do. Uh, or I could uh, ask it to look at me in particular and give it some different background information and say, what kind of person do I look like? I look male, and now how old do I look? 
and it's very unkind to me. Yeah, it's being unkind again. I'm 47, but if I, uh, if I try not to look too wrinkly, it hit 46 for a moment, but it tends to make me look in my 50s. I guess it's the miles. So that's large dimension in, one dimension out, because we're just getting a class out. Here's uh, large dimension in. It's exactly the same kind of thing. It's images in. Um, I'm going to do a quick Google image search here, pretty villages. Get some pictures back from Google. So that's how I'm going to use this as my source. And hopefully, if I've got good net connection, I can pick a picture that looks like where I came from. Um, this one looks like where I come from. So I'm clicking on that. And I'm telling it, look at that picture and give me two dimensions out this time, not just a class that might say village. I want to get out a latitude and longitude, which now allows me to throw that onto the map and say, here's where it looks like that picture came from, from past experience. And uh, I guess this one looks a little bit less uh, um, like Oxfordshire. And if I click on that, then we get some different estimate that this looks like southern Spain. Right, what else should we do here? Um, let's have a look at something where we're getting high dimensional out. So if I get myself in front of the camera here and grab a current image off the camera, uh, do you want to, you know, let's say yes to that, whatever that was. And hopefully what it'll do now is it'll take two lots of high dimensional input, a picture by Kandinsky and a grab off my webcam, and it's taken the essence of the Kandinsky style and imposed it on the photograph from the webcam. So now we're getting two lots of 10,000 pixel inputs and one lot of 10,000 pixel output out. So we're very high dimensional in, in both directions. And maybe we have time for one more here. Uh, maybe, yeah, one more. So one thing I suggested was you fill in the missing gaps. Well, very often thinking about what the, what's missing in things is, uh, is again, a bit of a leap of, uh, of imagination. So I've got a little photo here, so I've got all the code that's not very interesting. But if I run this, we can fill in the inf missing information, which is a fairly obvious bit of missing information. It was a black and white photo, so we've used past experience to guess the color. But we can go further than that, and we can fill in another bit of missing information. It's a photograph, which is two-dimensional. So hopefully, with a little bit of uh, deep thought on this, uh, on a pre-trained model, we can get an estimate here of how deep the photo is at different points. And we can see the dog's nose sticking out, and its forehead sticking out further than the background now. So one thing before I continue down this AI machine learning route that it's worth remembering is it's not the only uh, trick in town. It is not going to replace everything that you've ever known. It's a tool to use when you're data rich and understanding poor. We do all kinds of cool computation if you are the opposite way around. If you actually have an understanding of the physics or the, 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 the um, um, you know, chemistry or whatever of the situation, and you don't actually have heaps of data, then you're better off using classical modeling techniques. So let's get on to what we can do for that now. There's a pipeline that uh, needs to be followed here in the machine learning uh, process. The idea is that we start with some training data, and then we have to encode that into numbers. There's a step there that we have to get through in order to use all of the modern techniques, which are numerical. So we have to have a way of taking that photo and turning it into numbers. That's fairly easy. Taking words and turning them into numbers, is, uh, there's a little bit more um, choice about the way to go about it. And that gives us a bunch of numbers. We then take our model and we train it so that it adapts the model, just like we did with the fitting, to fit to the data. And then we end up with a trained model. And that can be expensive. It can take uh, that image identifier takes many hours to run on a GPU to, to train. But then the evaluation step is very fast. We do the same process with the input. We encode it. We get vectors. We put it through the trained model. We get vectors back, which you have to decode into some meaning at the end. Now, the good news is that where we have low dimensional output, things like classification or just predicting numbers, um, we're now at the stage that machine learning is essentially fully automated. You don't really need to know anything to be productive apart from how do you prepare the data and how do you tell the computer you want to do machine learning. So let me walk you through uh, that process. That's things like classification and prediction. Sequence prediction is low dimensional output as well. What comes next in sequence is typically just a name or a, a number or, or a letter. So let's do a bit of classic machine learning from scratch. I'm going to now drop into code here so you can see what you would have to do uh, as a developer in order to, um, to do the machine learning. So here's my classic machine learning data set. I've got um, some passengers of the Titanic. So the first passenger here was a uh, travel first class. They were 29 years old and female, and she survived when the ship sank. And so the task here is, can we predict what would happen if I were to go back in time and travel on the ship? What would my, be my chances? So the task here is classification. And that's our approach to the way that we expose models uh, to uh, users as a start, is to say, say what you want to do, not how it's done. So we'll say, classify the data, and uh, it'll go away and do some thinking about that data. 
hopefully only take a few seconds. And it's a bit small print, I'm afraid. I probably should have made this bigger. But uh, what's interesting, I think, about this example is buried in this small print here, just in this third line here, which says, I'll read it up for you if you can't see from the back. It says, method decision tree. So one of the models from machine learning is decision trees. And it's decided on its own that that is the best model to use for this data. Now, I might be an expert, and I might say I want to use k-nearest neighbor or neural networks, and if I am using nearest neighbor, I want to use a four-neighborhood with a Euclidean distance and all of these details that you might care about if you're an expert. But if we're trying to tackle the question of how to make people who are non-experts productive, then the first step should always be to automate all of that, all of those choices of which is the method, what's the hyperparameters, uh, what's that pipeline of encoding this thing. You'll see here it's said that uh, the data is nominal, numerical, nominal. So a category, a number, and a category. It's figured that out for itself. I don't have to go through lots of work trying to encode the thing into the correct vector for the, for the training. And the net result is that uh, I can now say, actually, I had a birthday since I wrote this example. Uh, and say, OK, I'm 48 and uh, male, and obviously I've traveled first class, um, and I would not have made it. And we can drill into that model a bit more deeply and say, what were my chances? And uh, you can see why it made that prediction. It, by this model, I had a 64% chance of, of drowning. Now, what we've gone through there is the whole training and application. We also have a deployment step. It's not strictly speaking uh, anything to do with AI and machine learning, but automation should take care of that as well. So I can go the final step and describe this sort of symbolic user interface uh, for, this, uh, for this predictor and deploy it to a website so that I can uh, make it available to you. And now if we uh, open that website, hopefully I get now a form where we can fill in some different values and uh, Let's say a 66-year-old, no, oh, no, sorry, we don't think we want 667. That is extrapolating too far. <laughs> and submit and uh, get back uh, the results of the model. So we've gone through the whole compute, develop, deploy cycle in a totally automated way in whatever that was, eight lines of code. And that's our aim to do with everything in, in computation, although the level of automation varies by the type of computation. Now, let me show you a completely different example. That was some nice numerical textual data. Let's do some computer vision, like the examples we saw before. So I'm going to start uh, here by capturing some data. And this is, um, uh, let's see if we can get this to work. So I'm going to show it, teach it rock, paper, scissors. So here's some examples of rock. And we'll get a few of those. And we'll do some paper. Whoops, getting on screen would help. And when we've got some of those, we'll give some scissors. And when we've got some of those, we'll say stop. So all I've done here, I've made a little user interface just to capture this input data. But that's just like the Titanic data. We've got some training examples and some outputs. So because of the kind of automation of, of the feature extraction and conversion to vectors, all I have to do is exactly the same thing as a developer. I say, just classify that data. And what it's going to do is uh, whatever it thinks is appropriate here. It's going to say logistic regression on image features. And now, hopefully, if I put the camera up, I can uh, put up rock, paper. Oh, go on, paper, paper. A little bit of paper, scissors, rock. If I st stay away from paper too much, it seems to be working OK. <laughs> so I think that's kind of pretty amazing that it's exactly the same task uh, to deal with um, you know, Titanic survival statistics and, and computer vision, because we can abstract away what it means to do all of those different steps. So if you're going to be a, an expert, in, or uh, at least a fake expert in the, in the field, then you also have to think about the methodology a little bit. And a lot of people think, well, you know, how does this work? That's not really the way you want to think about AI. You don't ask how, you just ask, does it work? Typically, when you do classical modeling, if I measure projectiles, then when I fit the parameters, they tell me something about the real world, what air resistance was on the object, or the air density, or things like this. Typically, the parameters aren't meaningful in any way we can interpret. So all we want to focus on is, does it give me useful predictions? And we have to treat it a little bit like magic, but magic that we don't trust. So one of the key parts that we can't skip out in, in doing machine learning work is we have to validate. And so the idea is, here's the basic idea, is you never use all of your data. In theory, you'd get a better model if you used all of it. More data is good. But you don't use all of your data for training the model. You hold some back. And then you measure for the data that you knew the answer to, but it doesn't because it never saw it, does it give a good prediction? And so um, let's do that quickly here with uh, a similar example to before. I'm going to classify some flowers. Here's the data. So I've got four measurements of these uh, three different kinds of, uh, of flowers. And I'm going to split that training set into 100 samples randomly that are, um, uh, I'm going to use for training. And the rest, about 30, I think it is, in this training set, um, I'm going to hold back for, for um, 
uh, for testing. And then I'll do the same classification I did before. It's getting easy now. We've seen this a few times. But now I'm going to pass that classifier itself through a measuring object to, uh, with the data it hasn't seen. And then we can query that for various metrics. So this is the headline one. This is saying it was 96% accurate. Well, for, that's a very contextual answer. Um, if I'm packaging bulbs up for a flower shop for irises, that's probably pretty good. If it's a self-drive car, that's pretty disastrous, that uh, it'll make uh, the dis right decision 96% of the time. I'll be lucky to get home alive. So you have to think about what these numbers mean a little bit. And then there's all kinds of ways to drill in and say, uh, for example, where did it go right and wrong? So we can see from uh, this example that uh, Satosa, there were 19 examples of, and it got every one of them right. But it got a little bit confused between Versicolor and Virginica flowers. It got one wrong in each direction. So that might guide us to where we need more training data or uh, where we want to be, uh, what kind of failures we're going to get. Um, again, that's fairly contextual. So what those measures are vary a little bit depending on, uh, on the type of machine learning you're doing. Um, if we do something like prediction, another classic example here, predicting the price of houses in Boston. I've got these different data points on, uh, on these flats and houses, and um, the data looks like... I've lost my mouse. There it is. Looks like this. So we've got some numbers. This is a pretty straightforward numerical data set. Here my task is prediction, because I want a number out, not a class. I don't want the word expensive or cheap. I want an actual prediction. Uh, and that changes the way we measure it a little bit. So uh, when we measure the thing, we can then start saying, well, what does that look like numerically? And the perfect thing in this prediction plot is uh, where you've got inputs on one side and outputs on the other is it sits on the straight line. We don't care which end of the straight line. We want it on that line. So we can see that mostly it's uh, doing a fairly good job, that there's some outliers up here that it does a poor job on. but. Um, Really, the headline measure here is that it's within about three point eight thousand, about four thousand dollars of the correct price on average across that across that spread. Okay, so so far I've focused on one very big domain, and probably the main domain of of AI and machine learning is supervised learning. The supervision there was that I told it the correct answer on some examples and said, "You learn what it is that makes those outputs what they are." But I did tell it what. Uh, what some correct answers were. Sometimes there's no truth. You have data, but you don't know anything about what it means and what, uh, what a correct prediction would be or wouldn't be. So I've picked an example here to illustrate this. I've chosen because it's something that we are very good at. Um, what I've got is some photographs of dogs, but I'm not telling the computer that they're dogs, so I have just import some uh, random selection of these three breeds of dog. And if we take a few samples here, so here's the first eight from my random collection. We've got, I think I picked Chihuahuas, Basset Hounds. Oh, it's in the code. Uh, Labradors, Chihuahuas, and Basset Hounds. But I'm not telling you that. I haven't labeled these things as Basset, Labrador. I've just said photographs. So what we can do there is we can have the computer look for patterns that are, are similar, that they have in common, and things that are different, and get something that tries to reduce these 10,000 data points down to a small number of numbers that actually is useful. We don't want to care necessarily about what the color of the top right can corner pixel is, but we might really care you know, how big the largest circles are in the image, or some sort of features like that. So now I can take this picture of a basset hand, and I can reduce it down to those learned features. Now, it's nice to imagine that these things are things we have names for, like the first number could be how big the nose was, and the second number could be how pointy the ears are. The reality is, as I said, it's very hard to understand what's going on inside machine learning. If we could identify these features, they would probably be something we have no human word for. It would be some kind of zigzaggy splodginess that has more green than gray in it, or something like that, that is a, a thing that it sees, and that could be represented by one of these numbers. But that doesn't matter, because as soon as we can represent the knowledge in this image um, in a space learned from these pictures of dogs in these um, 50, 60 numbers, then we can start doing calculations on the numbers. So one obvious thing we can do is to say, how close are two pictures if we imagine them as a distance in 60 space? So we've got two pictures of Basset Hounds here, and hopefully if this has worked, when I say compare the distance between the same Basset Hound and a, and a Chihuahua picture, we'll get a bigger number. So within the features that it discovered that seem to be common and different across pictures of dogs, it's learned a notion of, uh, of similarity that has been able to say that the, these two Basset Hounds look more similar than the, the Basset and the Chihuahua. Now, maybe it's because of the breed. Maybe it's because the background, one, they both had sky in the background or didn't or whatever. There could be some feature that is not what we're looking for. But it's come up with something that we can actually work with. 
Now, I can take that to, um, to kind of an extreme by saying, well, let's squash that down to two numbers. We'll represent all these dogs with just two numbers, and um, there'll be a composite of these 60 numbers. And when it's had a chance to think about this, what it'll do is use those two numbers to stick different pictures on the screen in different places. So this is rather cluttered. Let's make it nice and big. So let's see if it's worked here. Hopefully what we have, yep, so if we look over in this right-hand corner over here, we see that these appear to be mostly basset hounds. In the middle, we've got all the Labradors. Uh, so I'm guessing these are the Chihuahuas on the left, a little bit out of focus, but uh, there's certainly some in there. There seem to be dark Labradors at the top that seem it's somehow separated out as a different class than Labradors. But this clustering is doing one of the things that, that particularly unsupervised learning can do in a very useful way, which is to introduce insight in an undirected way. You know, the way we, for a long time, have used computers is like the way 1950s management was. You had a manager who was the boss and said, you will do this and you'll do it like that, and the workers just did what they were told, and computers were like that. Unsupervised learning is a little bit more like a modern office where you want your, your staff to actually have ideas of their own and contribute and have a discussion with you. So here, it's really obvious to us as humans that what it's found is dog breeds. Sometimes I do this example with uh, the last uh, 60 days closing prices on a bunch of assets in the finance markets, and you get clusters in just the same way. What, do the, what are the breeds of asset from those numbers? I don't know. That's something for us to think about and to uh, do further research in. But the fact that you get a group that has something in common within the space of, of, of financial assets is already an interesting insight, and uh, it may be that it's a useful insight that there's this sort of leap of faith that says, if I've got two uh, dogs that are close to each other, maybe they'll behave in a similar way. Well, that's probably a bit of a leap of faith from photographs, but it may well be that in financial markets that, uh, that having assets that are in a cluster helps us to use some of them to predict the behavior of others. Right? Investigation and validation would be needed to know if such a leap of faith was correct, but starting with the, uh, the clusters is a, is a good first step. Okay, now we end my utopian bit of the talk, because I'd love to be able to say, you don't need to know anything, we've done it all for you, buy Mathematica and you're done. <laughs> when you get high dimensional output, we're still not at that phase where you can just point the machine at the data and magic happens. Um, and of course, in pathological cases then, uh, and trickier data, then there's still work to be done as well. So in this space of high dimensional output, there are things that we need to contribute in order to make it do the right thing. Um, there are notions of what it means to be close. When you're particularly a number, well, we have a very obvious measure of whether the number is close to the number you wanted it to be. Um, if you're trying to make a picture, measuring whether that picture looks the way you want it to be is actually a complicated task in itself to define. So we need some kind of language to express that. Um, different neural networks have different characteristics. Some are very good with images, some are very good at uh, predicting sequences. And so there's a, there needs to be a language to describe the characteristics that we're trying to achieve, and therefore you need a language to be able to express that to the computer. So you need some kind of programming language for neural networks. Uh, and in the end, um, you know, I don't think for now there's really much getting away from that. But let's not be too depressed, there is plenty that we can do. So let me give you the basic concept again for those who aren't familiar. The idea of neural networks is they're basically just fitting again, but they're fits that feed more fits, that feed more fits, and in theory they get more and more abstracted, that you might be fitting in that image recognition at the bottom for corners and lines, but the next bit might be fitting for shapes using the corners and lines, and then the shapes might be used to decide whether it looks like objects, and then you might have something that takes concepts and decides whether it's a bottle of water or a glass or, or whatever based on the, the extra layers. And the basic idea is you mix Linear and nonlinear layers, alternately, vaguely speaking. Linear layers are just matrix multiplication, it's just fitting. The nonlinear layers are there to make it kind of complex so that something interesting happens, because if you just multiply a bunch of matrices, you could just make one matrix that was the result. It's never going to do anything interesting on its own, but by mixing in things that, that are a little bit less um, straightforward, then interesting features that can be trained pop out. And then there's a collection of special layers that have certain characteristics. Um, which is where your expertise needs to develop if you want to code these from, things from scratch. But we can still do a lot to automate. So even though you can't get away from that language of neural networks, there is quite a bit that can be done. So the first thing is, uh, let's skip the really simple example here and uh, um, take this first example I could think of that would do something. So we have a symbolic language, 
Just like when we type uh, equations into Mathematica and ask for the, to solve them or to do integrals or all these kinds of things, we have a language here described to describe neural networks. So this network is a linear layer, uh, which is a 10 by 10 matrix, basically. Then a nonlinear layer, it's going to do the tanch function. Another linear layer with some other number of nodes. I'd rather pick these numbers randomly, it seemed to work. And then we're going to go down to one so that we can map that to a scalar, sorry, the, to the output to a scalar, and we're going to tell it the input's going to be a scalar. So it's going to take one number in, do a bunch of magic, one number out. And um, this net initialize says the weights, the, the things that we want to learn, make them up, pick some random ones. So if we do that now, we've got this thing that represents the network. It hasn't done anything apart from fill in some random weights that are buried inside the network. But what it effectively is is a random function. So here's the function I just created. If I did this again, I'd get some completely different random function. So let's plot that again. Oh, not very different. Let's uh, sooner or later I'll get something more interesting. Okay, there's something a bit more interesting. So random functions. But buried in there are a bunch of numbers. This uh, this 10 by 20 matrix, I think it is. In fact, um, we have. Uh, one number in, so we need it, and we need to. So this this plumbing to say that in order to go from a 10 layer to a 20 layer, actually this one needs to be the 10 by 20 matrix, and then we need to go to a 20 by 1 matrix. That kind of inferred dimensionality that gets automated for us. We don't need to worry about the plumbing. We just say here's what our four layers are, um, and now we train it just like the pipeline that we had before when it was fully automated. So I'm going to take some data here, which is the sine function. So here's some inputs and outputs, just like we saw in the, uh, in the really simple case. And then we can say, train that model using the, those, uh, uh, those numbers. And it'll think about it for a few seconds. This line at the bottom is the error. So we want that to go down. Um, at some point, it may uh, go flat when it stops learning anything. That's it's still doing well, so I'll leave it to go. And what we end up with is, um, is something that, once trained, starts looking like a decent approximation for the sine function. So here I've just taken one number in, one number out. Not what I said with neural networks before, but I want to do something where you can kind of see the entire process. So it's just like the fully automated case, except that I have to get involved in the network here. I had to define this network in exactly the way I said at the beginning was kind of bad about uh, uh, models that um, we kind of want to try and avoid that, but there's no really avoiding it when you get into the neural network space. Now, the collection of layers available um, is quite large. Uh, let's make this a bit bigger here. So, okay, now I haven't got them fitting on screen properly without line breaking. But here's a whole bunch of layers, and they have special purposes. And this is where you need to start building up expertise if you want to synthesize these from things from scratch. Knowing that a gated recurrent layer is useful in sequence prediction is part of that education. I promised you could AI like an expert without having to study hard. So we're going to just ignore that uh, knowledge that you could create and say, what can you do then if you aren't going to learn all of these different layers? How, can you still get involved in the, in the big neural network game? Well, there's a couple of things we've done to, to make that easier. One is we're trying to build this big repository of ready-to-go, ready-trained neural networks. You can uh, visit this on the, on the web here. It's something called the Wolfram Neural Network Repository, and there's uh, nice web pages here to describe each one. But when I'm working within the Wolfram language here, the idea is that it's plumbed into the language. So I can just go and help myself to a network and reuse it. So I can take an existing network here. I'm going to get the Lunet trained on MNIST data network, slightly more complicated than the one that... Uh, that I had before. This one's got 11 layers, and you can see convolution layers and pooling layers, and we don't really care what they do because we can use this model straight out of the box and say, can we predict what those pictures of handwritten digits are? And it's saying uh, here that uh, this first digit looks like an 8 and a 0, 4, 1, 6. It's got them all right in this, in this case. So there's a big collection of these models. Um, we could help ourselves to something more complicated, like I could take the net model of, um, let's say, the one that I showed at the beginning, the image identifier. And let's go back to um, get a picture here. Let's have a picture of a tiger. And let's copy that image and apply it to the image. And we can see it's making a prediction of a tiger. Um, we don't have to concern ourselves with the fact that this particular model is really quite complicated. There's about 300 layers in this thing because there's about 20 outer layers. But some of the inner layers here themselves are sort of complicated layers with lots of sublayers in them. So we don't have to synthesize that thing. We can just take it and use it. But we want to do more than that. We also want to be able to do new things, not just out-of-the-box things that other people have solved for us. So one of the things we can do is we can take those models, and because we have the full specification, just like I wrote myself, uh, but better, we can take that, those models and retrain them. So I can take that net that uh, the, the MNIST 
net that we had a moment ago. And I can give it this Arabic uh, digit here. It's, um, it's seven, but the network was only trained on Latin characters. And so it doesn't know that. It doesn't know how to recognize that. It does its best. It looks like a four that's fallen over and doesn't have the vertical stroke on it um, or something like that. It's decided four is the best bet. But we could repurpose that network to a different training set of data. So here I'm just going to say, let's take the network that we just grabbed uh, that was pre-trained, and we're going to train it with a new data set, which are going to be some Arabic letters, uh, digits from 1 through to 9. And uh, there's a small training set, so I'm not going to give it too long. It should be enough. Let's stop that early. And now when we say, let's take this newly trained net, you can see it's now making a, uh, a prediction that is more useful. I'm actually cheating here, of course, because I'm doing exactly what you shouldn't do with validation. The example that I used for the training was exactly the example that I used in the test. So it's kind of a cheat here. Um, uh, and um, you, know, you really need more than one example of each digit to do a decent job. But this idea that you could take something like the uh, image identifier and retrain it for uh, cancer cells and non-cancer cells instead of whether it's water bottles or glasses is just a, a retraining exercise. And it's a case of finding the network that is nearest in purpose to the one you're wanting and see if you can just hit it with new data. We can also adapt them to a new task. Now, this does take some knowledge, but it takes a lot less knowledge than synthesizing a network from scratch. Let's go back to this uh, existing network here. Uh, not that one. Um, the character recognizer. Um, this one here. So these layers here are targeted for recognizing the digits 0 through to 9. And that's really buried in the last couple of layers. You see this last layer here is uh, a linear layer 10. The reason why it's dimension 10 is there's 10 classes that we're going to end up in. And then it does a softmax layer, which is sort of a probability layer. It turns the features into something that will add up to 1. So all the probabilities, if we asked it, what's the chance that this is an 8, a 7, a 6, and a 5, those numbers should add up to 1. So those two layers are, and the decoder that says go from, um, from some number through to um, something that we present, those things are, are encoded into the network for the purpose it was designed for. But if we want to repurpose this, we don't have to rewrite the whole thing, and we don't even need to throw away the training data, we can adapt the network with a little bit of surgery. Because the, um, we've got a symbolic object for that network, it's just another piece of data. I can program to operate on that data just like if I was swapping the numbers in a matrix or, or, um, or you know, coloring a picture. I'm just changing the, the object. So what I can do is, uh, here's my basic surgery. I take the first nine layers, the ones that I do want to keep, and instead of the 10 and the softmax, I've replaced it with a 2 and a softmax so that I only have two classes of output. And then I've come up with a custom decoder that says, when we get finally to some numbers, you want to interpret those numbers as one of two classes, Arabic and Latin. So that's my surgery that has taken it from being a character recognizer to a language recognizer. So let's do that uh, surgery. And now I'm going to train it with some new data here, which has the numbers, that various digits that we've seen before. But now they're labeled in different ways. They're labeled as a um, uh, character goes to Arabic and another character that goes to Arabic. We're only interested in these two classes now. And um, if we give it a few seconds to think about that, let's again stop that early. Then hopefully now if we ask it, what does it know about those, um, uh, those letters, it's got its predictions that says the first ones are all Arabic letters and the last ones are all Latin letters. And I can drill into that softmax layer and say, what are the probabilities? Here again, I'm cheating because of the, um, uh, I'm reusing the training data, which is why it's so incredibly confident that it's definitely, definitely an Arabic letter, because it's actually seen that exact example before. So what is the human's role, then, in this? We still have a little bit of work to do to tell it uh, things like neural networks, but the first role for us is we've got to see the opportunities. We've got to make these conceptual leaps to say, what is it that we're trying to fill in? What does prediction mean in this context? We really have to worry about the data, is the data biased? Is there something wrong with it? We, we want to be able to focus the AI as well. Sometimes we can help because we know something that it doesn't that we can start off with. And I think I've got time just for two more examples here. Um, here's an example of focusing the AI. I've got some text here that I was predicting to be either a cat or a, uh, or a, um, uh, or a dog. And what we want to do, of course, is spot that the word cat is significant. But as a human, I can make this data set more powerful by telling it, first of all, that we're not interested in the letters. There's a lot of letters in there. Maybe C's are important, maybe D's are important, but we can tell it we care about words. That gives it a head start. I can then tell it that umlauts and uh, accents don't matter, so that this, uh, 
this O hat here, this derg, is just a, treat it like another letter, and we can say case doesn't matter. I don't care if its dog is capitalized or not. And as a result, if I, oops, I uh, hit the wrong key there. If I run this here, take a second to build here, I can give it some text it's never seen before. Derg with, a, uh, with an umlaut, it's never seen that before, and maybe I could give it one with a capital G, but a small d, I don't think there's any examples of that, and it can still make a reasonable prediction there because I've helped it to focus in. So if you know that all your photographs that you're doing image processing on is the shape you care about, not the color, then strip the color out. Help it to, to not have to learn that for itself, and it makes small amounts of data go further. You also, and this is a data question, is worry about stu artificial stupidity. It's very much about thinking about the right question and whether the data supports it. Here's my toy example. I've got some heights here of uh, people and whether they're male or female. So this one meter 82 person is male, and this one meter 60 person is female. And what I want to then do is to say, let's predict uh, if we've got somebody who's 1.6 meters tall, what gender are they? Now, that seems like a slightly surprising result, because the only example in the data that we got that's 1.6 was labeled female. And uh, it seems not to have learned anything useful from that. Well, actually, if we look at what it thinks about different heights for females, uh, sorry, the probability that somebody is female for different heights, you can see that while it uh, does make a significant shift around the 1 meter 70 point, actually the probability varies between 0.4, so 40%, and about 8%. It never thinks that they're female. And the reason is, if we go back to the data, the data was uh, horribly unbalanced here. I've got one, two, three, four examples of male and one of female. It doesn't know about the world, so as far as it's concerned, the world is full of men. And so, uh, of course, it's going to predict that it's male, because all the evidence is that uh, it's unlikely to be female. Now, this is very contextual again, that if, uh, you know, if this was uh, data collected in some kind of uh, men's club or the male changing rooms at the swimming pool, then maybe that's the correct assumption. In fact, uh, you know, we're getting the right prediction out. If this is supposed to represent the world as a whole, then we have to do something about it. And so there's all kinds of things in the details you can get involved in here where I'm going to say here that, uh, that uh, we'll do the same question, but I'm going to give it some prior knowledge here that says the background, before you look at the data, is that men and women are, are equally distributed. And now that I do that, it's able to adjust its probabilities and make a prediction that, given the data it's got, and given that background knowledge, um, uh, that this person is most likely to be female by about two-thirds. So it's, um, that's, that's the role of the human, is to think about where the data is going to mislead, what the questions mean, what the answers mean, and to worry about how much validation uh, we need to make that work. So let me wrap up, and I think I've got about a minute for questions uh, after this, uh, by saying, in the end, what our mission is in AI is to automate that pipeline. But actually, it's in the context of automating all of computation, not just machine learning. And to what, uh, you know, I'd love to talk about it more, but having a world of image processing and signal processing and graph theory is all very important for that, preparing the data for the AI. Um, and and our, our mission really is to empower you either as experts or as beginners to, to be productive, and hopefully I've made that case for the AI here. And you can download um, the talk or play around with Wolfram Technology free online on these links that I've put up on screen. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? I have a minute 40, so maybe two questions or one. Anyone? No? Okay, well thank you very much.